Here's the thing, you guys. I know that this is supposed to be tied nicely. I know the bow is supposed to look good. I just don't have the talent to make it happen. Every time I do it, it turns sideways. What is this? The only belt I know how to tie is a black belt. <laughs> Wish it was symmetrical. Okay, now I'm just not gonna pee. I will not pee for the rest of the night. Here's the idea, oops. I am going to an event tonight. It's kind of a little bit professional, a little bit casual event, so here's the fit. I'm gonna wear my flofers, that's what I call them. They are kind of a cross between a flat and a loafer. I completely 100% made up the word flofer. Now, I didn't realize this when I was still able-bodied, but when you have a disability and you need to go to an event, there's a ton of planning that goes into it. It's not as simple as just leaving your house for the event. And one of the things that I was thinking about as I was getting ready for this event is which mobility aid am I going to bring, if any? Am I even going to bring a mobility aid? My two most used mobility aids are my service dog and my walker. There are huge pros and cons to the service dog or the walker, but both help me mitigate my symptoms of POTS. POTS is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and it's basically that your heart rate goes way too fast when you stand up. Unfortunately, I also fall in the orthostatic hypotension camp, like literally got diagnosed with it, so I also sometimes just faint. Having a service dog or having a walker can help me for a lot of different reasons, but one is not necessarily better than the other, and it depends a lot on exactly where I'm going and kind of what my mood is. What exactly do I feel like I'm gonna need help with and what's the place gonna be like? What's the vibe? So today as I was preparing to go to this event, I kind of made my list of pros and cons for using a walker versus using a service dog, specifically for fainting or palpitations, um, cardiac issues. I now consider my POTS in remission for the most part because I went to POTS care. I saw Dr. Driscoll at POTS Care. I went through their full program. I wanna say that was probably two years ago now, and I'm still using my methods from that every single day. So now I'm at the point where I don't faint. But back in the day, when I was first diagnosed with POTS, and before I had it under control at all, I was fainting all over the place. Back when I was first diagnosed with POTS, I would not have been able to get away with just using my walker, because I was totally reliant on Buddy's alerts. Buddy alerts me before I faint, or even before I feel lightheaded, Buddy is on it. If you don't know, Buddy is my service dog. I should have introduced him way earlier. To give Buddy credit, there are a lot of things that Buddy can do for POTS that my walker can't do. Let's go down a list of those, but I'm also going to share what the walker does that sort of makes up for missing that task. Reaching down to the floor to pick up a dropped item can be very difficult for patients with orthostatic intolerance. One task a service dog can do is picking up dropped items off the floor. However, my walker has four wheels and a seat, so I usually just place my items on the walker and push them around like a grocery cart. A service dog can do deep pressure therapy. I have a whole video about deep pressure therapy. I'm not gonna get into that now. But that has to be done on the floor or on another safe place to sit. A walker, at least my walker, my type of walker, has a seat on it. So even though the walker can't provide pressure on my legs, it can provide a seat, a place for me to sit. And that's something that Buddy can't provide but is a lot nicer than just sitting on the floor. Buddy's service dog harness has a counterbalance handle on it. Counterbalance handle is just this really loose, it's made out of fleece inside, it's fleece lined, handle that sticks up over the top of his back. It makes it so that I can kind of hold on to him and I have a third point of reference to help me balance when I'm walking around. His harness is considered light mobility. He doesn't have a rigid harness that is pulling me around or guiding me places where I need to go because I'm not that visually impaired. And when I am visually impaired, it's very temporary. But what Buddy's Handle does do for me is provide an anchor point. If I do lose my balance momentarily, it holds me there. And it also, I don't know what it is, but just being able to touch something makes it so much easier to balance, especially when I have vertigo. That said, if I'm at a point where I have vertigo, 
I'm probably going to prefer the two perfectly stable points that my walker provides over the wiggly jiggly handle on top of the service dog. There are lots of other tasks that a service dog can do for pots, but those are some main ones that I think have comparisons to the walker. So if that new updated video is posted, I'll stick a card here. You can go ahead and check out the new POTS tasks video. If it's not posted yet, hit subscribe and that should be one of the very next ones that comes out. Also just a fun little tidbit, service dog POTS tasks was actually the fourth video that I ever made on YouTube when I was just starting out which means my second week on YouTube because I was doing two videos a week. That's the very humble beginnings of what became a really cool and pretty big channel. So I would be humbled and honored if you guys would go back and just watch that video, see where we started, and then I'll post this new one and we can celebrate how far we've come. But I don't wanna to spend too much time on service dog tasks because that's not really nitty gritty specific. It's not personal, it's not best friend stuff. So let's get into stuff that you're just gonna hear from a friend. I'll touch on one more task thing before we move on though. Buddy is of course a lot more multi-purpose than just these fainting tasks. So I also have a video about his migraine tasks. He helped me with migraine attacks as well. Moving on. Buddy is a lot more all-terrain than a walker. We love going on hikes. We love, these days we're going to pumpkin patches and farms, things like that. Sometimes the terrain can get bumpy and that can be tough for, uh, for the walker. Buddy is a lot more convenient for me when the terrain is rocky. All right, details. Dog hair. If I'm dressed like this, having a dog with me kind of excuses the dog hair but it does taint the overall professional look, especially if I'm wearing jet black pants or a jet black blazer. Hair, definitely a consideration. A walker is also substantially cheaper than a service dog. Most walkers that I saw that were the same style as mine were somewhere between $150 and $200, but I got mine used. Mine was a $15 thrift. I just happened to run into her at a store and I decided to give it a shot. One of the best decisions that I've literally ever made. Buying a new one is a little bit expensive, but it's a really nice piece of equipment. It doesn't have maintenance costs like a service dog does, and even a brand new one is probably gonna be cheaper than any standard vet visit. So cost is a big one. And speaking of maintenance cost, let's talk about maintenance time. The time that it takes to maintain a service dog is insane. I have an entire video just dedicated to talking about the time that goes into a service dog. Card. But a walker has no needs. I don't need to brush my walker before I take it to the grocery store. I don't need to get its energy out. I don't need to feed it in the morning. And I don't need to take it out when I have a migraine. And I don't need to take it out when it's raining. My walker doesn't have to pee, truly. And I mean this sincerely. Because of my disabled state, that makes it so that I require having a service dog. I would not be able to take care of my own service dog if I didn't have my husband here to do it. I don't take him for walks. My husband takes him for walks. For example, I wouldn't be able to do it by myself. I'm way too cold intolerant to take him for walks in the winter. And also, we don't want me out there when it's icy because my balance isn't great. So I depend on my husband. If you're someone who doesn't have someone else who would be able to do all of those standard dog care things, then a walker might be a better fit for you. I've also had situations where it just straight up wouldn't make sense to bring a service dog, or I couldn't. Like when we went to Utah, we did this big hike called Angel's Landing. There's a part where you're up and it's like two feet wide, you're up a thousand feet, two thousand feet high, and you're holding on to a chain. And Buddy would not have been safe to be up there with us. That was insane. But we also couldn't just leave Buddy in our RV while we were up doing this crazy hike. So we had to do daycare for him for that day. Daycare is a whole nother thing that you need to set up. If you're going to a new daycare, and especially if you're on vacation, you're gonna need like your vet records. You're gonna need to make sure that you have all of the dog's vaccines in order. You're gonna need to make sure that you're following the neutering protocols and whatever other things might be showing up with the, what's it called, the daycare place where you're going. It's not just as simple as showing up with your dog and saying, hey, can you take my dog? Sometimes stuff gets weird, or sometimes two dogs won't get along and they don't have kennels, and then like someone's dog has to go home. Like I've definitely heard of that happening too, where you think everything is gonna be fine and boom, your dog's vaccine isn't up to date. Well shoot, now you missed out on, on an activity. That kind of stuff could never happen with a walker because you could just leave the walker in the car. Other times that I have opted against bringing Buddy, Things that are super loud or super crowded, like a concert. I just don't want them getting knocked 
and if I'm gonna be seated most of the time anyway, I just, I don't need to risk that. Also not great for the hearing of the dogs unless they're wearing those earphone things, but again, it depends on your level of disability and exactly what you need. If I was still back in the days where I was fainting all the time, then yes, I would probably still opt to bring Buddy because I really depended on those alerts. But now that I'm less dependent on those alerts, maybe I'm gonna be a little bit more concerned with the balance and I'm gonna be less concerned with sudden fainting. And that's gonna change my strategy. One thing that's been kind of interesting for me throughout my whole journey has been the perception of the public. What does the public think when they see me and how am I being treated? It has changed a lot over the years as I've been pregnant or as I've had a baby, as I've had the service dog or a walker or some combination of all of these factors. The way the public treats you can change. One thing that's tricky with the public and service dogs is that there aren't super clear service dog laws in the United States. We've talked about this before. And what that means is that I need to make sure that Buddy is on his best behavior and it means that Buddy, I don't know how to say this to make it technically legally right, so don't copy this verbatim, but basically, if Buddy is not well behaved and if I don't seem disabled, we can get kicked out. It's, that's a huge, horrible oversimplification. But if I go in with my service dog and I'm having a decently healthy day, the employee doesn't think that I'm disabled, and Buddy does something and he misbehaves, I'm going to be labeled as a faker. There's gonna be a horrible situation with fake spotting. It's gonna be very uncomfortable probably, and it's something that gives a lot of service dog handlers a ton of anxiety. I have to be disabled in order to have him, and he has to be very well behaved in order to be there. There's none of that with the walker. Nobody suspects that I have the walker because I just feel like having a walker. For some reason with the service dog, people are like, oh, she wanted to bring her dog. Look how cute, he's such a cute dog. He's wearing a vest. Oh look, they're just shopping together. Or, oh you're so lucky you get to have a service dog, he's so cute. And while yeah, of course he's cute, I love to look at him and he does provide some emotional support, which is not a task and does not make him a service dog. I'm not gonna get those kinds of comments if I'm walking around with a walker. Nobody is like, oh look at her, she's pretending to be disabled because her walker is purple, oh my gosh. People aren't looking at me with my two kids and a walker and saying, oh look at her, she just wants attention. And especially because I'm on online because I'm you know sharing my story online I'm freaking out there with my cell phone like I've got a dog in my cell phone looking you know so vain it just doesn't look good but with the walker it comes off a little better it doesn't come off like I'm out there to be cute or like I'm just trying to bring my dog to a store and what that manifests as for me is I feel like it gives me more permission to be playful I can be a lot more playful when I'm out in public with my walker than when I'm out in public with my service dog I mentioned that when we're on a flat surface, the walker can hold my coffee, or it can hold my bag. But I didn't mention that it can hold the kids. I did not think that this is what it was going to be used for, but more often than not, if I'm out with the walker and the toddlers, my two toddlers want to sit side by side in my walker and get pushed as if it's a stroller. At first it made me a little bit nervous, but it does seem really sturdy. I've pretty well figured out how it folds, so I just have to be careful about how they get on and off the walker. But it's turned out to be a really great makeshift stroller, which of course is something that the dog can't do. If anything, the kids are a distraction for the dog because at their young age, they don't quite understand that he has on-duty mode and off-duty mode. Although, Buddy does a decent job of remembering to ignore them. That ended up being super convenient because at first I was like, how am I gonna have my walker and the stroller if I need to be able to push the kids, but now it's all combined into one because I can't push a walker and stroller at the same time. I would need to have another adult, so that worked out well. And this is kind of a funny story. I've had more than one person ask me, so I'm sure even more than that have thought it. The public legitimately asks me whether I have the walker for myself or if I have the walker for the babies because it's basically just a very compact stroller. And then I'm like, oh no, 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 it's, it's for myself. They just happen to really like it. The walker will never be as cute as Buddy, but I'm really glad that when I happened to run into a walker that was cheap and thriftable, it just happened to be a super cute shade of purple that matches like half of my outfits anyway. Before we wrap up here, I just wanted to reiterate that both are great. Both are extremely helpful and both have their place. I currently switch back and forth based on how I'm feeling that day, what kind of help I think I'm gonna need on the outing. Like I said earlier, what that terrain is, 
and I also factor in what other adults or children I'm going to have with me. For anyone curious, I don't currently work with both the service dog and the walker because I feel like the needs overlap enough that it's not worth the loss of hands. I just don't have enough hands for all of that. But two things, two big things, that I feel like they both do very well. One is that both the service dog and the walker alert the public that you are disabled. For me that's important because I'm so able passing and especially with the kids I seem even more able passing. I feel like having the walker or the service dog helps the public know that I might need more help, that I might be intellectually slow, or that I'm not just being a princess when I'm needing help loading my groceries into the car. I don't like being the kind of girl who has people waiting on her or who, you know, needs other people to do stuff for her. I love being self-sufficient, but I also realize that I have limitations and I feel very awkward coming off as someone who is not who I am on the inside. I'm really conscious of trying not to put my own problems on other people, get help from other people when I don't truly need it. That's an aside. The other thing is that both the service dog and the walker can help create some physical space in between you and the public. That's especially nice for those who are a little bit socially anxious. Service dogs can even have tasks related to that, although if you're socially anxious, a service dog can kind of make it worse because you get a lot of attention. But either way, you're gonna get a little bit of extra elbow room because of having your mobility aid. And you're also going to need a lot more elbow room that you're probably gonna get because your aid is probably gonna take up a good bit of space. But that's nothing to be ashamed of. It's okay to take up space and it's okay to need help. Well, I hope this video helps you with whatever decision is coming your way. And if you're battling with these things, don't give up. There are better days ahead and you will get the hang of this. Love you guys and I'll see you in the next one.